Joining us live is Barry Habib. Just to give you a few quick ideas about Barry, if you're, because it was interesting. I follow Barry religiously. Kyle follows him religiously. He was the, he was the speaker at a $10,000 event. That was the ticket price Tony Robbins put on, and this is who he chose. Ernst & Young, mor uh, mortgage professional, or excuse me, entrepreneur of the year, he spoke to the Federal Reserve and is widely credited with having saved the mortgage industry in 2020 from margin calls. The list goes on and on. You'll see his brilliance right now, taking complex uh, ideas and making them very simple to digest. If we have him ready here, via Zoom, we have Barry Habib. Barry Habib. Techniques and strategies that Barry has is hands down some of the best in the industry. This morning, I cited uh, Barry Habib, who's had an outstanding record as a the mortgage interest rate follower. I'll tell you something, I'm not too good to wash my hands. I try and learn every single day. That's a big number. That's the number that Barry Habib called for and all of Art Cash's followers have been looking for for quite a while. See if it holds. That's a big deal today. Who, though, would have predicted our 10-year yield would have fallen below five-tenths of a percent? Last Thursday, the claim and countdown brought in mortgage expert Barry Habib. Hope you guys were watching because here's what he said. I think the bond market in the 10-year goes to about a half of 1%. Very realistic, in my opinion. Boy, was he right. And this man knows more about real estate, markets, interest rates. If you want to be prepared for what's coming. All right, guys, so this is where are these going? Where are we Do you know what motivates the people around you? Hey, everybody. All right. And, and you know what? Now, now I could see you wonderful people a little bit there. Is that, that's Kyle. Thank you, folks. Now I could see. I appreciate that, Kyle. That certainly helps. Now, just want to make sure you guys could all see me. Yeah, you guys could see me. Say hi if you could see me. All right. And uh, I'm just going to test something out here just to make sure. Can you now see the screen? Just wave if you can see the screen and you can see. All right. We are in good shape, everybody. Terrific. Hope you guys are having a great conference. It is such an honor to be able to spend time with you wonderful people. And listen, there is a lot going on, but the chaos that we're going through does present lots of opportunities. It always does. I mean, I want you to think about this. All of your clients need you more than ever right now. And if you think about going to Google Trends and seeing what are the most commonly searched trends today, they are housing bubble, they are inflation, the Fed. And these are things that we need to make sure that we are well aware of and we understand. So we're going to go through all of this today. We're going to make sure we understand where the housing market's going, where interest rates are going, where inflation is going, because they're all tied together. A lot of people think that Mortgage rates, which are a big driver of the housing market, because as you know, for every 1% decline in mortgage rates, 5 million more people become eligible to purchase a home. And with anything, it's about supply and demand. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to take you to some very high level stuff, but I'm going to break it down for you so that you completely understand it. I promise you, we're going to talk about the housing market. We're going to answer the questions that your customer really needs to know what is on their mind, what they're worried about, why they should be looking at the opportunity today to purchase home, because it truly is. Right now is an incredible opportunity, but people just don't see it. So we're gonna take our time today, we're gonna go step by step, and we're gonna make sure that we're able to not just understand this, but so that you can teach it and you can help your clients see the opportunity that exists today. So first things first, let's understand what drives mortgage rates. It's not the Fed. Look, the Fed's hiked rates one and a half percent, but mortgage rates have come down by more than 1% in the past couple of months. So that's not connected. What is connected is inflation and mortgage rates. As inflation goes, so do mortgage rates. And there's an easy reason for that. If you think about, let's say you gave me a mortgage. And if you gave me a mortgage and I'm making you a fixed payment, every month you're going to get the same amount of money. And if you go out every month when you get that check for me and you go buy a shopping list of goods and services, well, maybe you get everything on your list this month and even next month and even the month after. But over time, you discover you can't get everything on that list anymore. You got to leave a few things off the list because inflation drives prices higher. And as inflation drives prices higher, it's really eroding your buying power. So 
The check still says the same amount of money, but it's not going as far. It's eroding. The buying power is disappearing slowly but surely. Now, when inflation is very low, that erosion is minimal. So you can offer a low interest rate and still be fine. But as inflation rises, the only defense you have is to charge a higher rate so you collect more money every month on that monthly payment to offset the more rapid rate of erosion from inflation. And that's it. So here's the lesson. When inflation goes up, mortgage rates go up. When inflation comes down, mortgage rates come down. So which way is inflation going? Because if we can understand this, then we can understand where mortgage rates are heading. And if we see mortgage rates heading a little bit lower, that's going to bring more buyers into a very tight inventory environment. Look, I, gotta, I don't have to tell you, you guys know better than anyone how tight the inventory environment is. So let's take a look at some slides and let's kind of go step by step here. So I really believe this is the opportunity that you have been waiting for in housing. But there are there is so much negativity, everybody, that, that they just miss it. I don't know if you folks saw the article that was in American Banker. And the article in American Banker says, is it time to quit mortgage and real estate? I mean, are you kidding me? Is it time to quit? So what do they say? They say, you know what? Refinance volume is down 80%. Purchase volume is down 40%. So overall volume is like down 60%. And we're saying, I, we understand that, but let's understand where things are going. So we appreciate the warning from American Banker, but it's certainly not time to quit. Now, I told you that mortgage rates and inflation follow each other. So here's a prime example. The pink line here, that's inflation. The line in blue, those are mortgage rates. Here's over the last several years. Watch this. Inflation goes up. What do mortgage rates do? They go up. Inflation comes down. Mortgage rates come down. Inflation goes sideways. Mortgage rates go sideways. Even this little blip up in inflation leads to a blip up in mortgage rates. They're very closely correlated. Now, the shaded area here was the recession that we had in early 2020. People forget we had a recession in February of 2020. And then at the end of March, we had a pandemic. So bang, bang, we had a double whammy and the Fed panicked. The government panicked. They did all kinds of things to try and help. And what did they do? One of the things they did was they physically bought the mortgage market. They bought mortgage rates so that mortgage rates would be at around 3%. You do that by buying mortgage bonds. It has nothing to do with interest rate changes by the Fed. This is actually going in and buying mortgage-backed securities, putting it on their balance sheet. And they called that program quantitative easing or QE. And notice during this QE period, mortgage rates, the blue line, see this 3% level? They stayed right at around 3%. Now that was okay initially when inflation was at one, but something started to happen. All that stimulus, all that QE, there's a lot of money floating around and inflation started to rise. But the Fed said, eh, don't worry about it. It's transitory, right? Well, they were dead wrong. And as inflation was taking off further and further and further, they finally woke up. Look, team, the reason we are in this mess that we are in right now is because the Fed did a very poor job. They were asleep at the wheel and people in government kept on doling out stimulus money. I, I believe that a lot of it was necessary, but they continued to overdo it and overstimulate the economy. And the result is the inflation that we're all living with right now. And now what they're trying to do is they've gone to the printing press and they printed it. And now they got a vacuum cleaner out and they're trying to suck it up. And that's painful. The Fed's even said that's painful. So the inflation continued to rise. And the Fed finally said, hey, let's stop with the quantitative easing. And when they stopped with the quantitative easing, what did mortgage rates do? Well, now that the Fed wasn't buying the market, mortgage rates did what they always do. And they started to move higher. Last spring and early summer, when inflation started to come down a little bit, so did mortgage rates. But then in the fall, when, mortgage, when inflation took off, so did mortgage rates. Now, since the end of last year, we have seen inflation come down. And while not in a straight line, mortgage rates have come down as well. So the key question is, where do we go from here? Now, we think inflation comes down for lots of reasons. And one of them is we are starting to see a lot of discounts out there for prices in stores. Part of that is because inventory. Inventory before the pandemic was already building. And then we had the pandemic and no goods were coming in. So remember when you used to go shopping and there was very little on the shelves, hard to get things, hard to get toilet paper. Remember all those horrible days? Well, we started to slowly open up, then China shut down. But now we've opened back up, supply chains are back up, and we're past previous inventories. In fact, it's like record levels of inventory. So what do you do? You have to put stuff on sale to get rid of it. You're getting bombarded with your emails with sale, discount, discount, discount. That is disinflationary, and that should help lead to lower interest rates. One of the big components in determining inflation are shelter costs. 
shelter costs make up 43% of the inflation readings that you get. So that's a big number. But there is a problem with shelter is that it lags. You see, in real time, shelter costs, which make up rents and owner's equivalent rent, you have to understand the way the government looks at inflation for housing. When they, they look at housing, it's called shelter. They don't look at home prices. They don't look at mortgage rates. Because if you think about it, what if somebody doesn't have a mortgage? What if they're paying different interest rates? What if their credit score is different? That's not inflationary. They consider housing a service. So the way they view housing and the, and the changes in inflationary pressure is by taking a look at what rents are going for and the changes in rents and something they call owner's equivalent rent. How much do you think you could take your home and rent it out for? And that's the way that they determine it. Right, wrong, whatever. That's the system. So we have to understand how the game is played. So right now, as you could see, shelter costs have gone from going up 18% a year in January of 2022 to now going up just 3% a year. But the problem is the Fed does not look at and the inflation numbers don't look at real time. They count the last 12 months, each month being equal. So back 12 months ago is carrying equal weight to where we are today. But here's what's even worse than that. If you signed your lease 10 months ago, that's fine. But what if you just told them, here's what I'm paying rent 10 months ago, but you signed your lease eight months before that or nine months before that. So it's a very long lag. It's somewhere between a year and a year and a half lag before it shows up in the numbers that we see in the actual inflation readings that drive mortgage rates, kind of like a roller coaster. The front of a roller coaster, when it reaches the apex, is heading lower, but the back is going up. So in real time, shelter costs are coming down, but the way it's shown in CPI, it's still going up. Here's the reading in CPI, and you can see it is still moving higher. Now, eventually, this will turn over, and I think it turns over very soon. So what I would like to show you here is what the lag looks like. You see this big drop that occurred? Well, we didn't see the drop occur until about a year later. And then when it started going up, we see the move up about a year later. So we can only imagine that this peak occurred about a year ago, so we should be very close to a peak. And soon enough, we should start to see this head lower and give us a little bit of relief from the pressure of inflation from shelter costs. Now, you could do a mathematical calculation here. The difference between shelter costs in CPI and real time is about 4.9%. It weighs 43% of CPI. So it really is pushing CPI about 2% higher than it should be. So mortgage rates are probably about a percent and a half higher than where they really should be. And eventually we should see that catch up. That means you should probably see mortgage rates perhaps sometime this summer in the mid five, low five, who knows, we get lucky, maybe even tease 5% or get beneath it. But I believe that's where we're going. Now, just imagine what's gonna happen to the housing market when you unleash a lot of buyers at around 5% or 5.5% mortgage rates in an environment where inventory is very, very tight. Now, you started to see some of this happen in January. Mortgage rates got to six, and now you were starting to get multiple offers. So what's going to happen if we get below six for an extended period of time in an environment where inventory is even less than it was before? Well, you can imagine what happens when people start having multiple offers. Prices tend to move higher. So what caused mortgage rates to go up? Well, we know the Fed's culpable here. This is James Bullard. He is the St. Louis Fed president, and many Fed members, our Fed chair, many others, have been referencing the jobs numbers that we got last month for the month of January. And they've been claiming, oh, a blowout jobs report, unemployment's ticking to a 50-year low. But team, you have to look deeper. Very few people do. Don't think the Fed does because they don't understand this stuff. Don't give them too much credit. They've never been in the real world. So when you take a look at the actual report, it showed 517,000 jobs gained last month. And everybody thought, oh my gosh, the, the job market's so hot. But doesn't it make you scratch your head? Because all we've been hearing about is all these layoffs. Who's hiring all these people? Well, this is from the job report, which has two components. One is the business survey, and the other is a household survey. The business survey showed 517,000 job creations. The household survey showed almost 900,000 job creations. Who the heck's hiring all these people, right? Well, they weren't hiring them. You see, if you look deep into the numbers, which the Fed doesn't do and most people don't do, you will see that we didn't gain 517,000 jobs. We actually lost, this is right from the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, 2,500,000 jobs in January. But what they said was, they said, well, normally 
You might see 3 million jobs lost in January from when people let those um, holiday shopping hires go. So we didn't gain 3 million jobs, 517,000 jobs. We lost 2.5 million, but they said, we usually lose 3 million. So poof, it looks like we gained 500,000. Folks, we actually lost 2.5 million jobs. Now, when you take a look at the household survey, it showed 894,000 jobs created. But that's also a lot of gimmicks. One of those gimmicks, what was it? It's something called the population control effect. That sounds like it should be in a sci-fi movie, right? Well, what they said was, we picked up workers that we missed. They were undocumented workers from early 2022, January, February, March of 2022, to the tune of about 810,000 of them. Now, from a logical standpoint, wouldn't you just go back and revise those months to reflect the accurate amount of jobs? No, not our government. You know what they did? They said, ah, we'll just throw them into January of 2023. They were not in January of 2023. Because they did that, we showed 894,000 jobs gained. But really, after figuring out this population control effect, there were only 84,000 jobs created, not 894. And as a result, people said it's a 50-year low in unemployment at 3.4%, but the real unemployment rate, if you didn't have that effect, was 3.9%. Very different story. It's important that you understand what goes on because eventually this catches up. And the way that the jobs market looks, if it's really hot, it makes mortgage rates worse. When this eventually catches up, you will see mortgage rates improve. And we saw the benefit of that today. We got the jobs report today. It came in 311,000 jobs, but there were some revisions. And what we saw here was that the unemployment rate went up because we didn't have that fake stuff going in there from 3.4 to 3.6%. But there was something in there that was very, very interesting. And that was called the duration of employment of people unemployed less than five weeks. So that was an astonishing amount of growth. 343,000 more people were unemployed for less than five weeks from last month's report. I want you to think of a bucket. Imagine a bucket being filled with water on one side, but then having a hole where it drains on the other. Well, this bucket of unemployed people for five weeks or less rose by 343. So that means more water should have come in, but it didn't. Initial jobless claims were not coming in. You see, there was only 194,000 initial jobless claims, not very many. So why did the bucket fill? Is because it was harder for people to find a job. It was taking them longer than five weeks to find a job. So that's telling us that the job market is slowing. Otherwise, we wouldn't see this suddenly rise by 343,000. And the big growth of the job market has been leisure and hospitality. It's been adding more than 100,000 jobs each month. And today's report for February was no exception, 105,000 jobs gained. But I want you to take a look at this chart. This is the jobs in leisure and hospitality. Then COVID came and it all got shut down. But since then, look at the huge amount of jobs. Half of all the job gains since COVID have been people getting their jobs back from leisure and hospitality. But take a look, we're almost back to normal. And now while we don't know exactly where normal is, there's not a lot more juice to squeeze out of this. And when you take a look at what the future looks like, there's the job openings and labor turnover report. Now this report is job postings. This is, I put an article out or I put something out on LinkedIn or Indeed or ZipRecruiter that I want to hire somebody, right? So these are help wanted in my restaurant, okay, or in my hotel for these types of leisure and hospitality. Well, for the first time, that dropped in the latest report. It dropped by 194,000. Now, if you have less job openings, then eventually there's less job hirings. And that supports our theory that the engine of job growth is going to slow. You're going to see a slowdown here, and that is good for mortgage rates and probably lead to a recession. So why haven't we been in a recession? Well, likely because people are staving it off based upon their savings and credit cards. Let me explain. The top line is credit card balances. So notice how before COVID, and this is the recession and COVID period, we were jacking up our credit cards pretty darn good. 
And our savings rate was just under 10%. So about 10% of what we made, we were saving. But then we had the recession and then COVID, bang, bang, bang. So what did the government do? Hey, we got to help. Here's a great big stimulus check. Now everything's shut down. So I got nothing to do. So that money went right to my bank account. And the only thing I could spend it on is paying off my credit cards. And look at this. You pay off your credit cards by draining your savings. It's just amazing what happened here, right? And then right behind that, I got another stimulus check. So I don't own anything on my credit cards. Let's go out and spend it. I like some name brand stuff. Let's go and buy, buy stuff at the mall. Let's do that. And we spent the second stimulus much faster than the first. But don't worry, we got another third stimulus, even bigger. But we spent that even faster. So I guess people like the stimulus lifestyle. So when the stimulus stopped, how'd they keep the party going? Well, my credit cards don't have any balances. So I'll just start charging away. And I got money in savings. How about if I suck the money out of there? Now our savings rate used to be 10%. Now it's three and a half percent. And our credit card balances, which are paid off, are now at all time record highs. Ladies and gentlemen, even this has an expiration date. And when it happens, the economy hits the wall, we get job losses, we get a recession. Now, how does a recession affect us in mortgage and real estate? Well, you should know that mortgage rates always go down during recessions. Here's 60 years worth of data. The last recession went down 1% then more. The one before, more than 1% then more, almost 1% then more, more than 2% then more, 5% then more, 4%. You get the picture. Mortgage rates go down during recessions. Okay, but isn't that bad for real estate? Because that's what the media is going to say. The media is going to get out there and they're going to say, oh, we're headed for recession. Don't buy any real estate. They couldn't be further from the truth. Now, what's the bad thing about a recession? About one and a half million people will temporarily and sadly lose their jobs. So chances are they may not be eligible to be a home buyer at that point. But for every 1% drop, you now have 5 million new people that now can become eligible. So the new entrants overwhelm those who are no longer eligible. And that's why the next chart shows you that housing, oops, sorry, housing always does well during recessions, but that's not what the media says. Here's Diana Olick. Diana Olick will tell you on CNBC every single day for the last eight years that there's a housing bubble, right? If you listen to the media or people like this, here's what you heard. Back in 2015, eight years ago, she said, we're in a housing bubble larger than 2006, but all prices have done has gone up since then, right? So if you missed out on buying a $300,000 home that year, you lost $15,000. The next month, I'm sorry, the next year she says, hey, um, we're in a new housing bubble. So rather than say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, we're in a new housing bubble. So prices went up again that year. The following year, she said, home ownership does not build wealth. That was five years ago, six years ago, rather. Has, does that, you know anybody who has not built wealth in real estate in the past six years? And of course, prices went up. Five years ago, she says, it's better to rent than to buy in today's housing market. Please show me the one person who says, oh, thank goodness for the last five years, I've been throwing my money away on rent, paying my landlord's mortgage and missed out on all the amazing appreciation. Show me the one person, okay? So wrong again. The following year, in the middle of the year, she says, hey, before you buy your home, think twice, watch my special report, which was the housing market's about to shift in a bad way. Well, it didn't shift in a bad way. Prices kept going up. So her scare tactics, if they affected people, they missed out again. And then at the end of 2019, she gave her forecast for 2020 saying, don't buy rent because next year is going to be hard on the housing market. Well, it was only hard if you didn't buy a home because prices went up 16%. And then a year and a half ago, she goes, the housing boom, it's over. A sales fall to a pandemic low. But since then, we've seen prices go up 18%. You know, home prices have nearly doubled since she's been spewing this poison and yelling, there's a housing bubble, there's a housing bubble, there's a housing bubble. And here, it illustrates to you what happens during recessions for home values. Here is 80 years worth of data, and you can see all the recessions, all these shaded areas of recessions, home values up, 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 up during and after recession, eight out of nine times. Only one time it didn't, but here we have some special circumstances. The bubble came before the recession, not the recession causing the bubble. In fact, it was the recession that kind of started to help things level off. But what caused the housing bubble. What caused the housing bubble? It was simply too much supply of homes and not enough demand. So 
just like anything else. When there's too much of it and not enough people that buy it, prices go down. So how do we measure supply and demand? Supply of homes is measured by builders completing homes and putting them on the market, not starting to build a home. It's not somebody selling their home because they got to buy another one. It is a builder completing a home and putting it on the market. That's home completions, which equals supply. Now, demand, how do you calculate demand? Demand is calculated by household formations. So how do we see what a household formation is? Here's a simple example. Imagine mom and dad and the child. They live in one household. At some point in time, that child grows and moves out and gets their own place. It's still the same family. It's still mom, dad, and a child, but they now have two households instead of one. So they have formed a household. The next chart shows you in the blue lines for the last 20 years, how many households were formed in the United States. And the gold bars show you how many homes were completed by builders. Now notice here in 2004 and 2005 was pretty close. There's another thing you should know. Because homes age and they have to be replaced over time, builders need to create about 100,000 more homes than there is for demand because those homes need to be replaced. So you can see in 2004, it was pretty well balanced. 2005, pretty well balanced. But holy cow, what the heck happened in 2006? Builders went crazy. They built more homes than they ever had in history, 2 million homes. Look at today. We don't even come close to that. We're below 1.5 million for, since, since then. We've never even come close. But one second here, the demand fell off a cliff. Why did household formations drop so much? And this imbalance created more supply than demand and too much inventory. The next year, it got even worse because look how much more supply there was than demand. And by 2008, we had a full-blown housing bubble, ladies and gentlemen, and that was bad. It took a while for it to level off, but if you wanna know why the housing market has been so strong, Look at what happens here. Too much demand, not enough inventory, pushing prices higher. So now a lot of people, they say, oh, it's a housing bubble. It's going to be a housing bubble. Housing's going to crash. So many people putting that crap out there. Why? Go, because prices have gone up. Nope. Things don't crash because pricing hasn't got, has gone up. They crash because of imbalances in the system like this. So what we really need to ask is, can this happen again? Well, Fortunately, we know how many homes builders are going to put up because you can't snap your fingers and a home appears. It takes a while to construct that home. But not only that, you have to go through the process of plans, approvals, permits. So you have good visibility over the next couple of years as to how much inventory is coming on the market. And we know that's about 1.4 million homes. Now, remember, there's going to be about 100,000 homes that get retired each year. So it's really about 1.3 million homes that should be hitting the market for new supply. But could we see a situation where demand falls off a cliff like this? That's scary, right? Well, what caused this? Let's think about it. The median age of a first time home buyer is 33, year old, 33 years old. So what happened? Why were there so many fewer 33 year olds in 2006 and 2007? Why did the number drop so much? Well. Maybe it might help us to take a look at, did something change in the birth rates? Fortunately, I have a chart that shows you the birth rates. So if you were 33 years old in 2006, let's do the math. That means you were born in 1973. If you were born in 1973, when 2006 came around, you were 33 years old. So let's look at the birth rates from 1973. And as you can see, here's 1973, and here's the birth rates. Holy cow. It dropped off a cliff and then fell again, leveled off before going up. That sure looks a lot like what happened 33 years later, didn't it? Drop, drop, levels off, goes up. Well, that's because if these people were born, they're going to be 33 years old, 33 years later. So it should follow the same pattern. So why did this happen? Was there a reason and can it happen again? Well, something did happen in 1973. Now, I'll give you the reason for it, but before we do, in today's day and age, a lot of people get awfully sensitive about things. So I want to I want to just say as a disclaimer here, I have no opinion whatsoever. I am simply stating the statistical reason. So everybody, let's please just understand that. 1973, abortions were legalized. As a result of abortions were legalized, statistically, there were less births. And it followed suit into the next year. I mean, and, and then it leveled off and then started to go back up which led to 33 years later, drop, drop, level off and going up. 
So, okay, so we know that that's not going to happen again. So what does the future hold? We know 1.3 million homes are going to be the net that we're going to get. But how about household formations? Household formations in 2023, 33 years old, you were born what year, everybody? You were born in 1990. Let's take a look at birth rates from 1990. Whoa, big difference from 1973, isn't it? 74. You see, we're in a position where the demand is going to continue to outweigh the supply. Now, a lot of people are hibernating because we got awfully fast from 3% to 7% and it caused some shocks in the mortgage market. As mortgage rates come down, and they will, recession, lower inflation, mortgage rates get more realistic, you're going to unleash a horde of buyers on the market. Now, let's really dispel this BS about housing bubble happening again. I want to explain to you by looking at this chart, what a beautiful picture it points. So these are vacancy rates. They go all the way back to 1985. And notice for homeowners, the vacancy rate was pretty steady. And for rentals, also pretty steady until the housing market started to get very hot in the early 2000s. And what did people do? They started to buy homes to flip them. And as they started doing that, they weren't even renting them. They were just trying to buy them and flip them. And do you remember all the crazy mortgages? Do you know what the mortgage application was? Here's a mirror, fog it up. Let me take your pulse. You're approved, right? That was the no income, no asset, job, eh, optional, down payment. Who needs a down payment, right? Credit score, lousy credit score, you're fine, right? So this was the type of environment we have. We clearly have nothing like that today. But as a result, people were just trying to buy homes who weren't qualified for them and flip them. You remember the movie in the big short? They go to see the go-go dancer and she's shaking her stuff and she's going, I've got five homes and a condo, right? That was what you were looking at. People were just buying homes and trying to flip them. And you could see it here in the vacancy rates and rentals and then even in the homeownership vacancy rates. People were saying that they're going to live there, but they didn't. And once the bubble hit, things started to level off. And today you see vacancy rates dropping in both home ownership and rental. People are buying homes today to really live in them. People buying homes today as an investment to really have renters there. People aren't looking to just game the system and flip them. These vacancy rates are not just low. They're at all time lows. And if that weren't enough to dispel the BS about a housing bubble, you want to talk about housing bubble. In 2007, there were 4 million units for sale in home inventory. Today, 980,000, less than a million. So we have 3 million less homes for sale, but hold on a second. Our population since then has grown by 30 million. 30 million more people, 3 million fewer homes. How in the world can you talk about a bubble when you look at something like this? Now, hold on a second. I said 980,000 homes for sale. That doesn't even tell the real story because of that, a very high percentage because the housing market remains so hot, 40% are already under contract. You can't sell those. They're under contract. They're going to be closing soon. So how much is active listings? Only 578,000. In a country of nearly 340 million people, we've got 578,000 homes that are available for sale and active listings. How does that compare to historical? Less than half. This is more normal. We're less than half. I don't have to tell you. How's your inventory levels, everybody? Very low. So what happens when you're going to have a whole bunch of bars? Now, how about all the crap about people saying, oh, what about foreclosures? Well, folks, today, the average home, 42% of the average home is a mortgage. 58% is equity. So the loan to value today on average is 42%. In 2008, it was 81%. Only 19% equity in 2008. No wonder why people were handing in the keys back then. But today, you've got too much equity. It's not going to happen. Now, a big thing people talk about is affordability. If you're going to talk about affordability, you got to do the math. So let's do the math together. In 2021, the market's red hot. We all know that. So if you're going to buy a home with a $400,000 mortgage, back then the rate was three and three quarters and your payment's $1,850 a month. Okay. Now they compare it to today. Now home values since 2021 to today have gone up about 6%. So that means you got to account for the fact that I'm going to need a 6% higher mortgage. So to buy a similar home, I got to take out a mortgage of 424,000. Okay. And the rate's gone up. Now rates a little less than this, but let's just say six and three quarters. That means my monthly payment is 900 bucks a month more than it was back in 2021. And this is where everybody gets crazy and they say it's not affordable. 
But you see, you have to dig a little deeper because we have good data on this. Fannie Mae shows us the average income that people were making in 2021 to buy this home with this payment. And as it turns out, think about two income earners earning about $50,000 a year, or the household income is about 9,000 bucks a month. Now we have good data from ADP, the payroll company. They measure 25 million payroll records, 25 million. And what they said is that incomes from last year to now have gone up 7.2%. That means these people are making $648 more. It doesn't cover it, but it's eating into it. But there is another problem, inflation. Inflation for food, gas, and services, it's costing a family 250 bucks a month more. And here's the problem. My payments are 1150 more. My income's 648 more. So right now it's less affordable by 500 bucks a month. And that's the facts, okay? We can't argue with that, but hold on a second. This is a snapshot in time. The great Wayne Gretzky, he didn't skate to where the puck was. He skated to where the puck is going. Do you want to help your customers see the opportunity? Let's look at where the puck is going. Let's look at where the market's going. Now, incomes from 2021 to 2022 went up by 7.2%. So what are they going to go up this year? So if you go by ADP, they say 7.2. If you go by the Fed, the Atlanta Fed says 6.7. If you go by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they say 5.4%. Let's be super conservative and let's say it's only 5%. 5% increase means I make another $473 a month. So that means while my payment's gone up 1150 my income's gone up 11.30, which means I'm only $20 less affordable. By the summer of this year, I'll be $20 less affordable, and that's negligible and make the market very similar in affordability to where it was in 2021. But hold on a second. Inflation's coming down. That means mortgage rates will come down. And what if we're right? And mortgage rates come down to 5.5% from their current 6.5%. And I believe they will, if not lower. Well, that means I reduce my payment further, and you can make a mathematical argument that it'll be $327 more affordable the summer of this year than it was in 2021. And I don't have to tell you what it was like in 2021. So what was our forecast? Lower inflation means lower rates. A recession-like slowdown means lower rates. I just showed you what the effect of incomes increasing will do to affordability, and we have no affordability problem this summer. We know, you know, and I showed you the stats on tight inventory. And then what's your alternative? What, are you going to rent? How many of you look for rent for your clients? Is that a picnic? Can you not find anything? Are the rents super expensive? Are the rents rising? Of course, it is no picnic. You're paying somebody else's mortgage. So our forecast is for low single digit appreciation for most of the country. We're not saying 20%. Let's just say 3%. Is that a bad thing? Well, let me show you. Look, Everybody wants to time the market and say, I want the bottom of the market. Now, look, we, have, we feel really confident that after the market has gone up, housing went up 121 months in a row. That's 10 years in one month. Without a break, home values increased one month to the next. Think about that. That's amazing. All along the line, the media has been crying housing bubble, as I've showed you. But since July, home values have dropped a little bit. Now, it depends on what area you're in, what market you're in, but let's just say they dropped two or 3%. Now, some places it might've been more. Look, if you're in San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, Phoenix, Seattle, it might've dropped a little bit more than that, certainly because they've got a little over their skis in those markets, but we are very near a bottom. As soon as rates start to drop a little bit, you will see that bottom and you'll see prices come up. So when is the best time to do it? Well, obviously the best time would be at the bottom. The only thing is I am not good enough to pick the exact date where there's a bottom. I'm just not that good. So I'm resigned to the fact I'm going to miss the bottom. And so should your customers. Your customer is going to miss it. So if they're going to miss the exact day that there's a bottom, where are they going to miss it? Well, here's what most people do. They wait till there's a bottom. Prices start going up. Rates are lower. And they say, okay, now it's all clear. Here's where I'm going to jump in. Problem is, is that the seller is more competent, confident. There's more competition and prices are already going up. The smart time to do it is now. You want to get it before the bottom. Use the fear in the media. Use the seller's fear. Use less competition, a little bit better selection to jump in now and get the best price. You see, let me show you a case study. The last time we had a market bottom was in 2012, so around 11 years ago. Now, notice prices were kind of coming down slowly, but then once they hit bottom, look how fast they went up. In fact, Home values in the year after the bottom 
went up 8%, 8%. But one second here, that's with inventory back in 2012 of 2.4 million. We've got 980,000 in inventory now. I can't even imagine the pressure that housing will come under once we reverse from the bottom with lower rates. I'm not saying 8%. I'm just saying 3%, okay, as a safe guess. So 3%, what would that do? Well, here's some math. If it was a $500,000 home with a $400,000 mortgage, now in the past month or so, rates have gone up about 1%. So people said, oh, I'm going to wait because rates went up. No, rates going up is your friend. This is the opportunity you've been waiting for because the increase in rate cost you two fifty dollars a month and over a year, it's $3,000, but you'll refinance before that. So this might only cost you a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks. But what did you gain? I can negotiate at least 2% now on a $500,000 home that saves me 10,000. And then if I'm right, we only go up 3%. Last time we went up 8% the next year, okay? I'm only saying 3%, that's 15,000, which means I gained 25,000. And let's just say it cost me a little money to refinance because I dropped the rates drop. So maybe between what I use up of the monthly payment and the refinance cost me 5,000 bucks. Why are you going to throw away a $20,000 opportunity? Because that's the difference if you wait, folks. The time to do it is now. Now, one of the things you guys should think about doing, by the way, is scan this QR code. Now, I don't know if you've seen me on TV or on CNBC or on Fox or Bloomberg, but, but they've also asked me to be the opening for a show called Financing the American Dream. And it's a great show. There's a lot of stuff that I put on there that are these types of topics, why there isn't a housing bubble, where the opportunities are. But then after I do my opening segment, it goes to individual realtors and mortgage professionals in their local market. And it is really powerful. I am watching real estate agents and mortgage professionals crush it. I have nothing to do with this company. I just do the opening for them. They just have me do the opening. They don't even pay me to do it, okay? I just do the opening segment. But a lot of realtors and a lot of mortgage professionals are killing it right now. Because imagine saying to somebody whose home you go to list, hey, I'll get you extra exposure because I can get your listing featured on CNBC if you list with me and we'll get more people to take a look at it and that'll drive the price up. This is a great tool. You may want to scan this. Again, I have nothing to do with it. They do charge you for that, okay? I don't know how much they charge, but all I can tell you is from the feedback that people give me, this is a great business idea. All right, why is this a great opportunity? Imagine a $500,000 home. Last year, I had to give you $50,000 over asking price. I couldn't even get a home inspection. But today, I can negotiate 2%, maybe more. That's a discount of $10,000. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Pay close attention. Do not take the price break. Do not take the price break. Here's what you do. Use it as a seller contribution of $10,000. And then do something like a 2-1 buy down. Because that 2-1 buy-down will cost them $9,000. They get $1,000 left over to use towards the closing cost. That means they need less cash at closing. Always a big concern. But now the rate they're going to get is like 4 quarter percent It's going to save them 500 bucks a month. Now, when rates come down end of this year, middle of this year, or into next year, whenever it is, they take the unused portion of this and they get it refunded. Because remember, this is two years worth. So they get the unused portion back. They can use that for their own money. They could use it to pay for a refinance. It's a home run for them. So they get the home of their dreams today. They get a four and a quarter percent rate today. They get a discount today. And then when everybody else realizes the opportunity that you showed them and prices start to go up, they sit back and rake in the appreciation. Now, here's another problem that you might have. You might have had somebody that you've spoken to not too distant past where you qualified them for a home when rates were lower. And suddenly in the last month, rates have gone up. So that person that you said, hey, you're qualified for, let's call it 600,000. Now they don't qualify anymore because rates gone up. I don't know if any of you are in that position. So what happens? You got to say to your customer, yeah, I know now it's only 550, but they saw the $600,000 market. They want that market. So now they're a little less motivated at 550. So what happens? You can actually save them because use the same strategy and use instead of a price break, use the discount towards a seller contribution and have somebody like Mike Penny to buy the rate down to a great rate. He can get a rate today around five and a quarter percent, which saves him 250 a month. But the best part about it is they're going to qualify for $50,000 more. So they get their home of their dreams today. They get a great rate today. Why in the world would you not do this? People just see, oh, rates are up. It's an obstacle. 
There are solutions. You just have to think more creatively and smarter. Use the seller contribution. And I could show you that the 2-1 buy-down mathematically gives you the lowest payment for the, last, for the first two and a half years. After that, it's the permanent buy-down. The discounted price is never the best choice. And even if you sold your home in the first one and a half years, the 2-1 buy-down makes you the most money. Between months six and, I'm sorry, 18 and 24, for a very short window, the price break would actually be the best choice by a little bit. But after two years or longer, if they're in that house without selling it, the permanent buy-down is your best choice. It is almost always, 99% of the time, the wrong choice to take the discount, the right choice to take the seller contribution towards either a 2-1 buy-down or a permanent buy-down. Now, some people are going to say, hey, maybe I should rent, right? So should I rent? No, you should not rent. Even with a high rate, renting is the wrong thing to do. $400,000 out of home, 10% down. Let's pick a rate of 6.5% and say they're going to live there for nine years and never refinance. Well, what's the negatives about buying a home? Well, property taxes could go up. I don't have to worry about that if I'm renting. Repair costs go up. I have to figure 2000 bucks a year. I don't have to worry about that renting. And then the cost to sell, not at today's value, but the future value which historically for the last 63 years, values across the country have gone up four and three quarters percent per year. So let's factor that in. Now let's imagine on a $400,000 home where you'd normally pay 3,200 a month. Let's say you're getting a steal on the rent, 2,900 bucks a month rent and rents typically go up 5% a year, let's say only 4%. So we're making it really pretty to rent, really ugly to buy. So what's the difference? Well, it's 500 bucks a month cheaper to rent initially. So I should rent, right? No. Look at the purple bar. Each year that rent goes up. By the fifth year, it's more expensive. And over the nine years, it's a little more expensive to rent than own. But wait, there's more. Don't forget a good portion of your monthly payment when you're having a mortgage payment is principal. People forget this. It's a forced savings plan. It's a huge difference in equity. It's actually cheaper to buy when you figure it's a forced savings plan. It comes out to over the nine years, 47,600 bucks, team. 47,000. Your customer is not told about this 47,000 benefit. And what about the four and three quarter percent average annual increase in appreciation? It's hard to calculate that. Four and three quarters percent on a $400,000 home, compounded annually for nine years. It's tough for us to do it, certainly for a customer to do. That's why Albert Einstein said it's the eighth wonder of the world. We got to do it because it's $207,000 benefit. Now, that means the home's going to be worth 607 in nine years. I got to pay 6% to sell it, but I do get a tax break. So what's the deal? It's better to buy the home than rent by 216,000. And by the way, if they refinance the thing to five and a half percent, it's over $300,000 benefit folks. Every year, except year one, it's better to buy and rent. So Mr. And Mrs. Client, if you think you're going to move in a year, rent, of course. But if you're going to be in this home two years or longer, why in the world would you not buy this home? And why would you even think about renting? Well, I don't like a 6% rate. Well, do you like $250,000 profit? This is what you have to show them. And this is something you have to do every day. Now, Mike Penny, who invited me to come to this today, he can certainly make this happen instantaneously for you. And you should be doing this all the time. Look, net worth is something we all want, right? If you want to be in the top 1% in the United States in net worth, you need to have $10.8 million. Big number. How about the top 2%? That's a super exclusive club. Two and a half million. Top 5%, you need a million dollars. Top 10%, the top tier, you need 800,000 in net worth. And if you want to be in the top 50% in this country, the top half, you need a half a million dollars in net worth. Now, Kiplinger's put this study out last month, but you know what they also said? Where did the net worth come from? On average, two thirds of all net worth came from, you guessed it, home equity. Folks, you can't get rich being a renter. You have to tell your clients that. You can't be, get rich by listening to the media and being afraid of real estate. Real estate has to be part of your plan if you want to get rich, period. Now, one of the things that's really critical is if you're going on a listing appointment, you need to show somebody what the market looks like. So how about every home in the market, what their subject property is, and an appraisal, an AVM that can be done in seconds. Again, Mike Penny can pull us up in seconds for you. And not only that, here's where all the comps are on a map, what they all sold for, one page. He could do this for you literally in three seconds with all the trends in the market. Think about the professional presentation, as well as I've got a real estate report card on the subject property. I want to show every potential buyer this real estate report card, what historical appreciation is, what the future looks like, how much your home's going to go up, what household formations are, and how many homes are being built, the rental situation, 
demographics, jobs, incomes, affordability, everything you need to know on one piece of paper. And this could be co-branded. Look, team, if I were going on a listing appointment right now, here's what I would say. I would say, Mr. and Mrs. Client, this is the way I am going to market your home to every potential buyer on social media, in every open house. What we're going to do is we're going to show them a buy versus rent comparison. I will show you them an AVM to show them the great deal they're getting. I'll show them a real estate report card to show them the future and the forecasted appreciation for the next 10 years so they could see the incredible wealth that they're going to create. Look, in the great book, The Art of War by Sun Tzu, every battle is won or lost before it's ever fought. This is what you need to be doing every day. You know, my friend, Mike Penny, who's there, if you just scan that QR code, you'll be able to get in touch with him. He can create these for you instantaneously. No charge to do it for you. Just have him do it for you. This is exactly what you want Mike to do for you. This is the way you want it. Look, the greatest investor of all time was Sir John Templeton. He said, the time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy. There's a lot of pessimism out there. Right now is the time for you to be a buyer. Remember that article we started off with, American Banker, who said, is it time to quit mortgage and real estate? It is true. Every statistic in that article was true, but I didn't tell you one thing. The article was written in 2014. Yeah, the market back in 2014 was very similar to what it feels like right now, the same statistics. And if people withdrew, if people quit in 2014, they missed the greatest eight-year run in the history of our industry. Now, look, I don't know what the next eight years has in store for us, but I do know this. Better times are ahead. They are around the corner. Activity will pick up. As rates come down, people will give up that 3% mortgage to buy the home of their dreams because their rate oftentimes is not 3%. They borrowed money on a home equity loan that they're going to be paying 9% thanks to the Fed. So their average rates are closer to four and a half. This is the opportunity you have been waiting for. Folks, I know a little bit about opportunity. Many of you helped me by purchasing my book, making it a number one bestseller, which is about finding opportunity. How to identify it called Money in the Streets. And look, I put a lot of short content out. You're welcome to take it, steal it, use it, show it to your customers on Instagram. My handle's I am Barry Habib. You can scan this and you can get in touch with me there. Please follow me, take that content and use it as yours and share it with your customers. The short videos explain a lot of the stuff we were talking about. Folks, I appreciate you. God bless you. And thank you so much for your time today. You guys are absolutely wonderful. Thank you so, so much. All right. That was uh, phenomenal. And Barry, I know you can't see the entire room, but we were supposed to go to lunch a half hour ago. And I don't think I've seen a single person get up and leave the room. So that's uh, a shout out to the value of the content you were providing, man. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you.